Hi, my name is Brenda Hunter. Most of you know me. I own Hunter CPA Group in Oxford, and I'm here to talk to you today about the taxes and the things that have changed so far in 2022. Um, these are the tax brackets that have changed for 2022. Most of it's just been adjusted for inflation, um, but as you can see, I know that you know even most of the tax brackets are stayed what they've been and just slightly been adjusted. Okay, the reason I show this to you, this is the 2022 long-term gains, uh, long-term capital gains. The reason this one's important is a lot of people don't realize that if you're single, you can have up to almost $42,000 of capital gains and not pay any capital, or 42,000 of other income and not pay any capital gains. And if you're married, $83,000. This became important back in 2020 when you didn't have to take your RMDs. And one of the reasons that Dan and Rocky are doing a lot of the RMD, or the, I'm sorry, the Roth conversions, one of the goals is to get less and less taxable income for you in the future because your social security is only taxable as much of, as other income you have and your capital gains are only taxable as much of other income you have. So as, as the tax rates go up, some of these other things are not as taxable if you don't have other income. I realize some of you have pension income that you, there's nothing we can do about that, but the, the IRAs and the other things, you know, we can control that if you don't have as much IRA income. Um, so now we're gonna go into some of the changes that have already happened in 20, 2022. A lot of people ask me about the charity deduction. There's an asterisk at the end, so far they've, alluded to, they're going to leave that the same. So this is if you don't itemize. Very few people do anymore because the standard deductions are so high, but they've got, gone ahead and given everybody that small charity deduction that you still can take above the line if you don't itemize. 300 for single, 600 for married. Um, two years ago it was uh, 300 for everybody. Um, then they split it last year and gave 600 for married. They're alluding that it's going to be the same this year. They haven't changed it yet, but they still have a couple months. Um, HSA amounts, for people who are, you, you know, for some people who are still putting in HSAs, you can't do this past 70, um, you can't do this past 75, but it does come in handy when you're um, paying for your own prescriptions on Medicare. Um, for those who are working or have their own business, um, mileage rates, because gas went up so much this year, First they raised it to 58 and a half cents, then July 1st they raised it up to 62 and a half cents. So if you have a small business or your own business, um, they did raise mileage up to 62 and a half cents the second half of the year. It's the bit largest, um, largest amount for mileage they've had in quite a few years. Now we're gonna get in um, to one of the really big things that changed this year, and that was the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, a lot of the things that did not make it into the Build Back Better got moved into the Inflation Reduction Act. Why it's called this, I don't really know. I don't think it's really going to help inflation all that much, but I think it sounds good. It makes people think something good's coming. There is some good things in here, though. Um, for anybody who was on the old, they used to call it Obamacare, then now that they moved it and we're calling it Marketplace, um, the subsidies, that was expiring, the money that was paying for subsidies for people that were on that type of insurance. This um, extended that to 2025. So if you were on Marketplace, it's now called Marketplace Insurance. This helps people to get subsidies on Marketplace Insurance um, for people who qualify through 2025. It also created, for those who don't know that, if you're on, if you, in your individual tax return, there is a minimum tax, but you still have to have a, a certain income level to trigger it. They created the same sort of thing for corporate taxes. You have to be in the billion, have to have a billion dollars worth of income, which doesn't affect most small, any small businesses really. And it has to be a C Corp. So it doesn't affect pass through businesses, but they're hoping to get some extra income to help pay for all the other stuff that they created in this bill. Make the corp, they make the corporations pay some. They also did some, um, some drug reform that is supposed to help seniors and it allows Medicare to negotiate the prices of certain prescription drugs. This was a big part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, they also put caps on what um, Medicare recipients have to pay on their drugs. So it, the out-of-pocket costs went down for people on Medicare. 
that was part of the Inflation Act. This is the one that got the most attention, and this is the one I got the most phone calls about, was they are hiring 87,000 agents, <laughs> um, and, and, this, and they're, they're going to fund the IRS to recover lost taxes. Now, this, they are actually hiring 8,700 agents over a 10-year ten, ten period. Now, every business I have in my uh, office can't hire people, so how they're going to hire 8,700, I don't know, but they claim that that's what they're going to do. Um, I would prefer that they put them in their customer service department, because I've called the IRS probably <laughs> about 150 times this week, and I have not gotten through once. Um, so you can't call the, it's really hard to get through to the IRS. Some weeks are easier than others, but this week is really difficult. I've been trying to get through for three clients, and I can't get through it all. So I wish they'd put some of these agents in their, um, in their customer service instead of their, um, but they're actually putting them in supposedly to go after lost taxes. So people don't probably realize it, but in the last few years, in 20 and 21, due to COVID and all the problems in the IRS, reviews and audits have been at an all-time low. Um, so this is what they're gonna do. They're gonna go after lost taxes. I wouldn't worry, most of the people in here probably don't have to worry too much. The, the areas that they're targeting, small businesses, um, rentals. Uh -huh. Um, they're actually going to have after a lot of earned income credits. So this is an area where there's a lot of fraud, earned income credits. Um, so there are some areas that we know they're targeting. Um, but if, you know, those areas, most of the ones in businesses, there are a lot of people that have hobbies that they label a business. Um, horses is a big one. Uh, people who drive race cars. You know, there's some that they target, people who own boats and call themselves a business, rent it out. Um, there's just some, there's just businesses that a lot of people do that um, if you don't show, ever show a profit and you have a business, those are going to be targeted in the next five years. Um, we try really hard to, to talk to our clients about those kind of things and say, you know, these are the things that, you know, they're going to be looking at and you have to be careful of that. If we see a trigger in one of our clients, we'll tell them, you know, this is what we think and you really need to be careful. And some people do have legitimate businesses that have losses. I mean, there's certain businesses that have been hit very hard by COVID. Just having a loss doesn't necessarily mean that you have fraud or that, you know, you're not doing your business properly. But there are some businesses that the IRS does consider not to be a real business. Another big part of the Inflation Reduction Act was all the green part, the green bills as they call them. This was the part that was originally in the other bill that never made it to the final cut. So now it's been moved into the Inflation Reduction Act. And what a lot of people don't know or maybe didn't realize was we used to have a lot of residential energy credits. Um, people could put new windows in, doors in a new roof and get a small credit on their tax return. Those actually expired, most of them, by 2020. Um, the only thing you could get in the last two years was if you put in something very big like solar, geothermal, one of those big items, and then you got a credit. Most of the other ones expired a couple of years ago. So they're bringing those back. So starting in 2023, um, there's some really big credits for doing some home improvements that really, they have to qualify for you know, to be an energy, you know, improvement. Um, so it used to be a $500 lifetime limit is now replaced by a $1,200 annual limit. And these are broken down into $150 for home energy audits. That would be if you brought in, say, consumers or somebody to do an audit on your home. Um, $250 for any exterior door, $500 total, $600 for exterior windows. Um, $600 for other like furnaces, air conditioning, water heaters, $2,000 for specialty items like biomass stoves, you know, those would be the things that qualify for kind of a special type of heat. Um, they, they took roofing out of this completely. They, part of the reason for that was to really qualify for the roofing credit, you had to get one of the special types of roofs, like metal roofs or one of those, and it got to be kind of crazy because most people were just putting 
a regular roof, but also including in, in, in insulation or something that was considered energy efficient, but it kind of created a lot of problems. They've taken the roofing completely out. To, it no longer qualifies. The other big item is electric cars. I know there's a lot of controversy about this. <laughs> But electric cars are back in. Most of the old electric cars had expired, um, the credits for them. There was a few still hanging out there in 21, but I did have some people who bought electric cars and were like, hey, I get a big credit. Well, depending on when that electric car had come on the market, a lot of them were starting to expire in 21. But they're back in 22, and they're going to go forward for several years. So you do get a $7,500 credit for the purchase of new qualified electric vehicles. There's a $40,000 credit for big, more commercial type vehicles. So they're trying to encourage like schools to buy electric buses. Um, and then a $4,000 or 30% 30 30 of the cost, that's for a used car. So you buy a used electric car, you either get a $4,000 credit or 30% of the, you, the value on it. So it just depends on which is um, the lesser amount. Um, there's an AGI limit on this now. It's $150 for um, married filing joint, or I'm sorry, single, and $225 for $225,000 for married filing joint. So it's pretty high, I mean, but it just depends on, um, but there is an income limit that didn't used to be. Um, they're also gonna start creating a system where, not in 22, but starting, or three, but starting in 24, they're gonna try to do this straight at the dealership, where you can get the credit and apply it right to, the, which they should have done in the first place, but, um, and it applies right to the, the purchase price of the car, which will make it easier on everybody than having to buy it, then get the credit back on your tax return. Um, but that won't happen until 2024. Um, I know a lot of, we had a, several clients who called and asked us about the e-bike credit. So when the Build Back Better first was brought out to the table, it had an e-bike credit in it, and it was very, and when it actually passed the first legislation but didn't make it through the second legislation, it was way pared down by the time it actually passed. In fact, it took like eight months to actually pass. Well, what happened was all these e-bike places were, you know, talking about this and people got excited while well, it didn't it was taken out and it never made it to the second one. So there's no e-bikes. Student loan forgiveness, I'm sure everybody's heard this in the news. This is a big thing. Um, it's an asterisk up there because it has not passed, um, but it is going to pass most likely. It's just how it look when it passes, we don't know. Um, but the, the amount of debt to be forgiven, $20,000 if you're considered lower income, that would be if you qualified for a Pell Grant. Um, $10,000 if you are not in that lower income category. Again, this could change, but this is what it looks like right now. Um, it's going to be based on your 2020 or 2021, whatever your last filed return is. And your income level is 125 for singles, 250 for married. Um, you will qualify for this. And it is not going to be considered taxable income for the forgiveness. Um, but again, this is still in process. They're still fighting about this and it could change. Um, retirement plans, I get a lot of people tell me they didn't, don't have to take RMDs. That was 2020, that has not changed. 2021, 2022, you have to take RMDs. Qualified charity distributions, still allowed, still, um, you can defer up to $100,000 to charity and take it off your AGI for both federal and state to a qualified charity, do it direct through your IRA. Um, they eliminated stretch IRAs for beneficiaries. The entire balance must be withdrawn within 10 years. Roth IRAs are not required to take RMDs. However, beneficiaries are required to take RMDs of Roth, Roth um, IRAs. Um, the penalty for missing an RMD for your IRA is 50% of the amount you were supposed to take. Um, we, it's a lot and you know, the IRA, you know, basically the point is they want you to take your RMDs. So if, if it happens, we tell people to take it as soon as you realized you took it, and then, you know, we'll beg for forgiveness after the fact. Um, we have never had ex anybody actually have to pay that penalty. So we have written a letter before on, that, on the behalf of somebody. So that's generally what, as soon as you realize you forgot to take it, take it as soon as you realize it. Um, the uniform life table was updated in 2022. Um, it changed the life expectancy all the way up to 119 years old. 
although I've heard it's actually coming back down. Um, but this is the one you're supposed to use. Most people, it's figured for you, but if anybody has multiple IRAs and needs help calculating their RMDs, I can do that for you. Just call my office. Um, Social Security, um, these are just, the numbers are updated every year for the amount you can earn if you're still working. Um, between 62 and full retirement age, which is different for everybody, um, it's somewhere between 65 and 67, depending on the year you were born, 1937 and 1960, it's prorated every two months. But um, you have to pay back a dollar for every $2, you go over the, that amount, 19,560. And 22, that's what you're allowed to make if you're not full retirement age. You can make 19,560. If you go over that amount and you're not full retirement age, you gotta pay back a dollar for every $2 you go over. In the calendar year you reach full retirement age, um, you can make 51,000. Instead of having to try to calculate that, they just set a dollar amount. Once you receive, re reach full retirement age, you can make as much as you want. Just because you can make as much as you want does not mean it's not taxable. <laughs> Social Security on the federal return is 85% taxable if you have other income. It's a calculation. For state, it's not taxable, but for federal, it is. It's a calculation. It might be not taxable, but that's another reason to get your money into Ross. How you all doing this morning? We're going to go over just a little bit about PNC from a liability standpoint on personal and business. Just very quick synopsis. Um, with the liability on auto, home, motorcycle, boat, umbrella, it really depends on your current situation. So there's not, not one thing I can say you have to do or you should do. Um, state minimum is $250,000 now. It used to be $20,000, $40,000. So we definitely want to do at least $250,000. Um, you can get a written exemption to the state of Michigan to be able to do $100,000. But that's the lowest you can go, but you have to have a written exemption for that. And then on the business side, again, you have the liability, personal property, building, autos, umbrella. This is going to be varied by what type of business you have and, and how much liability you actually need. Um, autos is the biggest one I see when it comes to businesses. A lot of them don't have enough coverage, and sometimes they have more autos on the policy than they actually have currently. I see that a lot. Like, they might start out with 10 never get around whether it's the um, insurance agent or them not calling. I, I've seen it up to three or four more vehicles that they've been paying for for a couple of years and they haven't even had that car for four or five years. So that, that's something to definitely double check um, on a yearly basis with your business insurance. But the biggest thing I want to talk about today is the difference between no fault insurance on your auto policy and then Medicare and Medicaid. So the biggest difference is, um, that, that you'll see. So Medicare and Medicaid both cover auto accidents. They'll pay 100% of your, uh, of any medical bills. But let's say I got in a bad accident and I sued the person. And let's say Medicaid paid out or Medicare paid out $50,000 in hospital bills, but I want a lawsuit for $75,000. Medicare and Medicaid are going to send you a bill for $50,000. So that you're going to be left with 25. So when you do sue somebody from an auto accident, it's, it's to make you whole, right? So if they award you 75,000, they think that's what, what, what it's worth from whatever your injury was in that auto accident. But other things that Medicare won't take care of. So if I got an accident and I couldn't walk anymore, I'm in a wheelchair, my car insurance will pay for a ramp to be built at my house. Medicare, Medicaid will not. So it's really about how much are you willing to come out of pocket, and that's what insurance is, right? How, how, much, how much money do I want to have from a liability standpoint, and how much money do I want to put on the insurance company from a liability standpoint? So, so there are different things. I don't want to get into all of them. Um, that's really one of the big things. Um, and then wage loss, obviously Medicare, Medicaid, any health insurance will not cover wage loss. If you're retired, obviously you don't have to worry about that in the first place. Um, and then the other thing is with the no fault, you're covered. Um, I know they're starting to talk about they want to do a time capsule on it, not for life. So right now, if I got hurt and every year I had to be seen by a doctor because of that accident, it's covered through my auto insurance. Obviously, with Medicare and Medicaid, it's, it's going to be the same thing. You're, you're still going to be covered. You're going 
to the doctor, whether it's for annual checkup or because of this accident, after you get an annual checkup on it because of that. Um, there is huge savings. Uh, I have clients that are 100% on it, and I have clients that are not on it at all for, from, a, um, from the no fault. So they have Medicare or Medicaid completely covering it, and then others have the auto insurance covering completely. It's really what kind of exposure you're willing to come out of pocket for. Again, my example was I'm in a wheelchair, I need a ramp built at my house. Um, that's just one, but again, that's on, on a case by case. Like if I, if I got an accident and I'm only making, I'm on a fixed income only social security, I know it's a little more expensive to pay for the auto insurance, but I know I can't afford anything out of pocket if something bad did happen because Medicare or Medicaid will not pay for it. Now, if I'm, if I'm wealthier and I know I can come out of pocket fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to build a ramp or however much it costs, I might take that risk to save potentially $800 to $1,000 a year uh, in, in annual um, expense for, for paying for auto insurance. But again, I think it's the case that case by case, it's really what can you stomach to come out of pocket if anything were to happen. Same thing, it's like life insurance, right? How much am I gonna assure myself for in case something happens for my family? You, you have so much money. Good. Welcome Don Rosenberg. Morning everyone. So I'm gonna introduce you or talk about the uh, world of elder law, the most complicated area on the planet. And elder law is for anybody who wants to be old one day, not just for the elderly. And when you do estate planning as an estate planner, I kick it up several notches and we address what the elder law is all about. I see some familiar faces in this audience. For those that have my documents, you are covered. All right. So what's the difference between estate planning attorney and elder law attorney? Well, a general power of attorney will limit the ability to prohibit gifts. And we're not talking about gifts to the kids, we're talking about if you're married, gifts to each other to protect and preserve assets. I could boldly say right now, I could walk into every nursing home, go room to room and bed to bed, and I can say that everybody in this room doesn't want to go into a nursing home ever, right? I promised my dad he'd never go into a nursing home, but he got C. diff, and unfortunately he had to be gowned and it was a contagious disease. Man makes plans and God laughs, so you never know what's gonna happen. So there are strategies that we can do proactively to protect everything you own. If I could walk into every nursing home, go room to room and protect 100% of a married couple's assets. And it's gotten easier because I've gotten a couple of wins within the state of Michigan after they fought us. So we don't want, we want to make sure there's language in, the home, in, the, in your trust to protect your uh, home. Uh, one of the biggest things that we do differently than most attorneys is when you have a health care power of attorney, I assume you all have them, it becomes effective when you're unable to participate in your decisions. Well, my mom was 91, competent enough to make poor decisions every time. Uh, my wife had some health issues where I needed to be involved, and I didn't want to wait for them to be declared disabled to become a partner in their affairs. So basically, when we draft health care power of attorneys, we want them effective immediately for day-to-day -day medical care. It doesn't mean my wife can make my decisions unless I acquiesce, but we can be involved together as opposed to waiting for that disability to happen. Uh, we want to provide for children. We want to consider Medicare and veterans benefits. So basically, we do estate planning and we kick it up a notch. And if you become disabled, you have that choice. You can let super court supervise your affairs or you can do some special documents. Everybody in this room, you don't have to have a dime to uh, get sick, so you need the healthcare power of attorney. And the healthcare power of attorney has to address mental health law these days, as well as end of life when you're unable to participate in your decisions. And day-to-day -day medical care, we, effect, we believe it effective immediately. The financial power of attorney, it's critical. If you do a living trust, you can't put your IRAs in the document, in the trust, because it's a taxable event. So you better have a comprehensive power of attorney that allows us to deal with your qualified funds and digital assets, and making gifts, and protecting and preserving the assets. And not all power of attorneys are the same. I mean, I could tell stories for the next three hours. This is just like an appetizer. You're sitting down at a meal, and they give you a little appetizer, and it's not enough because, you know, elder law, I can do two, three-hour presentations. So we're just going to talk about, you know, just the highlights. 
So when we look at power of attorneys, we want them, is it effective immediately or springing? And springing means it becomes disabled. And I can't begin to tell you how important that is. Uh, if you point to each other and there's nobody else in line, when one becomes, one's gone, one becomes disabled, you're into probate. Coasions, photocopy, digital reproductions. I tell all my clients when they sign their health care power of attorney, give copies to your doctors, put a copy in your glove box, because if there's an emergency, your loved one is going to be jumping in the car and you're going to need it. I used to keep 10 copies when my parents were in their 90s, and every time I went to the emergency room, I would walk, open my glove box and I'd walk in with the, with the power of attorney. And if you are technically savvy, put it in your Dropbox. Put it in the cloud. Does it allow gifting? Can agents withdraw life support? Can make mental health decisions? Can, it, can you provide protected health information under HIPAA? This is, the, can you amend, revise, or revoke the estate plan? I'm going to spend a second on this. Because this is, sounds like the most egregious and dangerous power allowing someone to change your estate plan. But when we do documents, for a husband and wife, and 10, 15 years down the road, God forbid one, the husband has dementia. They had created an I love you plan. Something happened to the wife, it went to the husband. Something happened to the husband, it went to the wife. Something happened to both of them, where'd it go? To the kids. But if the wife is the caregiver, and 70% of all caregivers over the age of 70 go first, it doesn't make sense anymore for that wife, if the wife goes first, which happens all the time. My dad was a caregiver for my mom. He, went, he left at 94 and she passed away at 98. Long lines. And if, so if the caregiver goes first and all the assets go to the ill spouse and they can't live independently at home, they're just gonna take all those assets with them for their cost of care. So in most cases, the wife will have the authority to change the estate plan to say, this is my trust now. If I go first, it's going to my kids. The kids can't touch the assets until dad's gone because they're going to take care of them, and we've protected everything. So we're planning for the unthinkable where the well spouse goes first, and it does happen. And then you can see the other things. And of course, when we deal with long-term care, the thought is, the government says, if you give money away, had you not given it away, you could have paid for your cost of care. And the government says, for every $10,000 you give away, we're going to disqualify you for benefits. OK? It's not a five-year look back. It's a five-year look-see. So if you give money away, and not all gifts are considered gifts under Medicaid law, but if you give money away, they're going to want to see if you apply for benefits. And when I talk about Medicaid, everybody thinks it's horrible care. You can all avoid this issue by buying long-term care insurance or looking at a hybrid policy, which I have. But the bottom line is, is that everyone thinks it's substandard care. Most facilities in the state of Michigan are dual certified. They all accept a Medicare bed, and they all accept a Medicaid bed, and they're basically the same bed at the same time. So when the funds run out, you could stay there and receive the care. And if you're protecting the assets, you may need a sitter, you may need extra care, you may need, you know, the bottom line is, it's providing the quality of care. It's not about saving the kid's inheritance. So the unforgiving look back is, say grandma gives $40,000 to their granddaughter for college, child for support, a church donation. Grandma has a stroke or severe dementia, a few years later, grandma applies for Medicaid, and they look back five years, and they find out the gift, she's still not eligible for four months. So she's out of money, and now we have to pay for care privately. One of the most egregious laws in the state of Michigan, and I can't figure out why it's this way, but if you pay for care to a relative or non-relative agency or non-agency, and there's no written care contract supported by a doctor's letter, Medicaid says that's considered a gift. That's horrible. Considered what? A gift under Medicaid. I have a family that just came to me. Their mom had been at home for seven years. They ran out of money. They paid a private caregiver, a woman off the street, for seven years. The son paid a third of the cost, the mom paid a third of the cost, and the daughter paid a third of the cost. 
I have $210,000 that the mom paid without a caregiving contract. They have to come up with 21 months of private pay before Medicaid will take over. It is the most egregious law, and we're working with the legislature right now trying to get it changed. And not all transfers are considered divestments under Medicaid law. You give a gift to a blind or disabled child or into a special needs child, regardless of age or marital status, it is not considered a gift. I had a family that their daughter was, had MS. She was on SSDI because she worked all these years. The mom went into a nursing home. They had a $524,000 brokerage account. We gave it to her. Mom qualified for Medicaid. Transfer to a home to a child that takes care of you in your own home for a period of two years. And the doctor says, had you taken care of that child, if you had, had not taken care of your mom for two years, she would have needed to go someplace else. The house can be transferred to them without any consequences. If you transfer something for fair value, it's not a gift. This is a really funny situation. I had a client come to me, and the grandson says, my grandma's in the nursing home, and we got applied for Medicaid. I asked, let me see six months of bank statements, not five years of records. And I find ATM withdrawals every other day at the Motor City Casino for two, three hundred dollars. So I said, give me another year's of bank statements. And sure enough, there's ATM withdrawals. And grandma's 95. So what did you think? I said the grandson was taking mom's money, and grandma's money, and going to the casino, right? He swore that it was his grandmother's passion, and he would take her to the casino all the time. And I said, yeah, right. I just happened to call the Motor City Casino. I talked to the attorney. He says, Give me the send me a couple statements, and I will look up the video and look at the transactions, and I will see who's at the ATM. Guess what? It was grandma. Oh. <laughs> I got three videos. I got an affidavit, and we applied for Medicaid. It was a transfer for value. You can do whatever you want with your money. Uh, God forbid one has a, you, you give your children $100,000 to go buy their home. And God forbid you have a stroke tomorrow. That's not a gift because it wasn't in transfer in contemplation of long-term care Medicaid. And then this is the most egregious thing that I can think of is this thing, payment for care without a prop. You can pay with a proper care contract, but if you don't, it's now considered a gift. And spending to zero is not a strategy. You don't have to spend your money for care. Caring for a loved one shouldn't cost the savings of a lifetime. We, we work our tails off for, the, for these issues. So we can do proactive estate planning. We can do community spousal estate planning. That's what I talked about where the well spouse goes first. We can convert assets to non-countable to non-countable, such as pay off a mortgage, that type of thing. Or we can buy a home. We can do half a loaf strategy, which is very, very complicated. So I'm just going to try to explain it pretty quickly. If a single person's in a nursing home, as they step in, they had the health, they had the financial power of attorney says, my daughter, you can make the gift. So let's say they give away, they have $300,000 in assets. And the daughter says, I'm going to give $200,000 and put it in my account. That's a 20-month penalty. Let's say they have income and the money that they didn't give over 20 months will pay during that penalty period. So basically, we split the money into a gift period a gift portion, and a portion that we can create income to pay for the cost of care. So basically, what, how that's done is you take the money that wasn't gifted and you put it into a, an immediate annuity. It's like a freezer in this corner. Put the money in the freezer, we weld the freezer shut, and we get a check once a month equal to the penalty of Medicaid. When the freezer's empty, the $200,000 is protected. So single individuals using this half a loaf strategy can probably protect somewhere between 50 and 70% of the assets. But the bottom line is you've got to be proactive or we're going to go to court and ask the court to allow us to do this. And if you're in Wayne County, God help you. Macomb County, probably going to be OK. Actually, my former partner just got nominated, is now a, new, a judge. In Oakland County, there's four judges, and one may say, maybe not. The rest will be allow us. So, but then it gets costly and time consuming. So basically, you can do this with documents. Houdini, if you put your house in a trust, 
it causes problems. A house in a living trust is not a protected asset for Medicaid, okay? If you have a house in a trust, I want you to leave here today and make sure that your insurance policy has your house as an addition, your trust as an additional insured. Because there's a new court case that says if it's not named as an additional insured, you may not have insurance. So make sure that you understand if you have your house in your trust, you, ha you have an your trust as an additional insured. So when we do estate plans, we do ladybird deeds. A ladybird deed is a deed where you own it, you can do whatever you want with it, but upon your death, it's in the name of the trust. No probate, no capital gains, and no estate recovery. When a house is in a trust, it, we can sometimes use the value to boost what the well spouse can keep. The last thing I really want to talk about is the sole benefit trust and name on the check. I see that I'm getting out of my time, but I'm going to go over a few minutes unless Dan pulls me off. <laughs> So what if I told you I qualified Dan Gilbert for Medicaid? Not ethically. It wouldn't be a right because, you know, you don't qualify millionaires for Medicaid if you don't, you know, because everyone, no one wants to go to nursing. We want to stay at home. We want to use our interest, our dividends, our income, and we want to stay at home for care. But do you know what the cost of home care today is? $12,000 Not even close. $28 an hour today because of the pandemic. $22,000 a month. I was quoted 12 for one thing. For home care? Recently? An agency? Really? So that's basically $16 an hour? I didn't figure it out. Okay. Can you share the agency with me later? <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm serious. I'll give you my card. I want you to share the agency. So the pandemic has caused because people can't find help. So their paying wages are higher. So basically the average cost of home care today is about $240,000 a year, 24 seven. It's crazy. So people are, looking, are, not, are going broke and they wanna make sure that they can protect their assets. So if a spouse goes into a nursing home, the well spouse can keep about 140,000 or half the assets up to 140,000 in a home. I'm just simplifying it. Everything above and beyond that's considered at risk. The well spouse can create a special trust. You wouldn't do this now until the time came called the trust for a sole benefit. That trust is irrevocable, but it uses the well spouse's social security number, so it's not a taxable event. You put all the assets in there except IRAs, and there's no taxable event whatsoever. If I'm the son, I'm the trustee, and the trust says, Mom, I gotta give this back to you over the next five years on an annual basis based upon your life expectancy, and the money in that trust is not available or accountable for Medicaid. The state of Michigan fought us in 2015, tooth and nail. The ca case went all the way through the Michigan Supreme Court, it's called Hagedorn. The Michigan Supreme Court does nothing unanimously. You know, there's two political parties, blah, 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 and they agreed that the state of Michigan was overstepping their bounds and federal law allows for the sole benefit trust. So if anybody had assets that are not IRAs, you could put in a sole benefit trust and qualify for Medicaid like that. And we do that. The problem was you couldn't put IRAs or qualified funds in the sole benefit trust. So I recently had a client that was willing to be a test case. They said they had a $90,000 IRA, the dad was in a nursing home, the IRA was in dad's name, they had to cash it out, and we could put the net amount into the sole benefit trust. They said, no, we don't wanna do that. So I filed a Medicaid application, and I got the insurance company somehow, some way, to issue the check on the immediate annuity from the husband's IRA to the wife. So her name was on the check. I filed the Medicaid application, and I said, this is a sole benefit transfer to the well spouse the community spouse, federal allows it, you have to allow it. And we were ready to appeal it. They approved it. So now, every attorney in the state of Michigan is doing it, but basically you don't have to cash out IRAs. You can just put the name on the check if it's the well spouse's IRA or the ill spouse's IRA. So now with this strategy, we can protect 100% of a married couple's assets. So, as I said, this is an appetizer. It's the most complicated area on the planet. So three takeaways today. 
everyone should have a financial elder law durable power of attorney with the ability to regroup when we need to, including making gifts between husband and wife or to kids. Everybody should have a health care power of attorney. I would propose that it should be effective immediately for day-to-day -day medical care and that everybody understands if there's a health challenge in your life or to your loved one or to a family member, whoever you know, caring for a loved one shouldn't cost the savings of a lifetime. Spending to zero is not a strategy and we can protect and preserve the assets. And it's not about saving the kids' inheritance. It's about making sure that they get the best quality of life in the least restrictive setting at the least cost to you and your family. Okay, what are we gonna do today? We're gonna talk a little bit about how this year's been going. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's been interesting. Um, you got some economic growth still going on there, so that's, that's a good thing. Uh, inflation, well, that's kind of troublesome right now, and it seems to be holding on a little longer than uh, most thought it would. And then you got how the effects of all that is affecting the stock market. So we'll talk about a few things that are really kind of driving uh, some issues out there that we're a little bit concerned with and that we're watching and looking for strategies for you. Now, I think everybody in here is familiar with City National Rockdale's uh, economic and financial indicators. So we put this out on a monthly basis. And um, if you recall September, September's didn't really look good. And uh, unfortunately, everything that has a square box on it is going the wrong direction from an economic and financial standpoint. And uh, the thing that you, a couple of things you want to take away from these, these dials here is this is forward looking. So we're looking out six to nine months and saying, all right, what are things looking like in the future here? And when we see the dials go in the wrong direction, what does that tell us? Well, we're not through this mess yet, right? There's still, there's still some problems coming down the road. So we've got to keep an eye on that. The key is to try to figure out how do we navigate this with the least amount of downturn in the portfolios. Uh, and I'm going to come back to this slide because it's relative to some of the uh, uh, slides we have moving forward. Now, inflation. Inflation is one of the, the big things we're hearing about. And did anybody hear what the new numbers were for, for last month? Uh, inflate, the, what was the, the yeah, 8.2%. And they thought it was gonna be 8.1. Uh, they were optimistic. I'm not sure that 10 basis points really makes that much difference. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, it came in a lot worse than, than we all thought it was gonna be six months ago. So this is, this is lingering. And the, uh, the, the, the knowledgeable people, if you will, or the people who kind of know uh, what's going on from an economic standpoint, really feel this is gonna be taking months and months and months to rectify the, the, the inflation aspect of this. Now, um, when you think about the Fed relative to the inflation, the Fed has basically two big tools in their arsenal to try to get things under control. You've got interest rates or they could buy and sell assets. Well, most people are familiar with the Fed and the interest rates. I mean, we've got another one where the Fed are, are gonna meet and determine whether they're going to raise rates again. So from a federal standpoint, you've got the open market committee that gets together, looks at all the economic data, and then makes a determination. Do we lower rates? Do we raise rates? Do we keep them the same? And as you all know, over the last three hikes that we've had, they've gone to raising the rates up. And the unfortunate part with this, and I understand what they're trying to do, they're trying to slow the economy down and hopefully slow inflation down. But you've got two major factors <clears throat> out there that are gonna create problems for the Fed. Number one is energy. You know, as long as energy costs is up, that is inflationary big time to the extent that inflation or the, the energy rate is so high. Uh, just think about it. This 
country runs on energy. You can't get a truck from the west coast to the east coast without what? Energy, oil. And the prices are really high. So anytime that you have a cost to a business that goes up, guess who it gets passed on to? Passed on to us. And that's where the inflation starts coming into play. The other issue out there is wages. I mean, when you think about wages, wages have gone up dramatically. I mean, you want a decent paying job? Just go to McDonald's. You get $15 an hour, right? So it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's funny. Ch or Kim went into a McDonald's with a kid. She was running late, had to get something for the kids, and they wanted Happy Meals, right? Because that's what you get at McDonald's. And I recall, and not too long ago, when you could get three Happy Meals, and it was like, what, five, six dollars? And she said it was like 15 bucks for it. it. It literally doubled in price. That's your wages. Because they're having to pay a whole lot more. So if you've got those two issues that are not being addressed, and you're not going to address the wage issue, because when wages go up, do they ever come down? Not really. They, they kind of stay up there. So the other factor that can, can really play a big part is the energy. If we can get the energy costs back down, we can actually kind of soften this, this landing that we have here. Um, so let's go back to feds and the rates. This is actually, in this environment, a little bit inflationary in that when the feds raise rates to borrow and businesses now have to pay more to borrow, what does that do again? raises their cost, and what happens then? They raise their prices, and we pay a higher, higher rate on it. So there, this is a challenge for the Fed, and it doesn't look like they're going to slow down. We had uh, 50 basis points, 75 basis points, another 75, and uh, the wind blowing the way it is, we're probably looking at another 75 basis points. Um, if they follow, if they follow historical uh, precedents, they'll try to get the interest rates up as high as inflation. Wow, um, and you know, never really worked that well in the past. I mean, if you think about it, it always sends us into a recession when they start raising rates the way they do. Uh, they, they've just got a real challenge right now. Now, the other one is buying or selling assets. And this is the one that most people aren't really aware of, but this is probably a bigger issue than the interest rates right now. Uh, so what the, what the Fed does is the, they go and buy treasuries and securities from banks. And then they replace it with credit. What, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, they're basically printing money. They're, they're, they're borrowing something that they don't have. Uh, so at, at the end of the day, it, it's, we've got this balance sheet of debt on the Fed side. And that becomes an issue. And the reason it's an issue is this. You go back in 2000, we had normal steady growth. What is this? This is the Fed balance sheet over time. <clears throat> this is how much credit they have asked for over time. 2008, we had the financial crisis. What happened then? Well, you had QE1, QE2, QE2, Infinity. Uh, it, it, it really jacked up the balance sheet at that point. And at that point, everybody was basically saying, you know, this is already out of control. You know, how are they going to get this thing to where they can <laughs> reverse what they've done so far? And that's where the challenge is. So let's move forward. You come through this period here up to 2018 and a half, and we stayed level because the economy was doing pretty good at that point. They actually started reversing it, which was not really hurting the economy. There was a bit of a glitch in 2018 when they started it, and everybody probably remembers 2018, the last quarter, the market went down almost 20%. They were talking about a recession at that point and a market correction and everything. And at 19.4%, the S&P 500 did what? One week before the end of the year, it reversed. Um, so it kind of pulled itself out. But the issue here now is we get into COVID lockdowns. We shut down our country. All right, so what's the Fed gonna do? They're lowering rates and they're increasing their balance sheet. 
and they're increasing it rapidly. So we're in a situation where our, our balance sheet is, you know, you think about where we were really 20 years ago and where we are today. This is the bigger problem out there right now, and this is what we're watching and how it's going to affect the bond, the credit market, because this is the biggest issue relative to the, to the bond markets out there. Um, so we're keeping an eye on them. Uh, it's going to have an effect on, on the businesses. So the, the question is, is how do they unravel this situation? And how long is it gonna take to do it? They can't do it real fast because that would tank the country. We, we all know that. So at this point, we've gotta kinda watch to see how they try to slow it down. If we have a robust economy, they could start slowing it down and be probably relatively okay 20 years from now. But you go through multiple cycles between them, and that's where the, that's where the challenge is here. So we're really watching the, the credit market to see where can we go, where, what can we do to protect the assets if the correction in the market continues on which we do think is, is going to happen. So as the feds are trying to tighten things up, so too are the banks tightening up their requirements for borrowing money. And effectively, that's what the Fed is trying to do. They're trying to slow things down a bit. Um, so this is, this is definitely in a, a tightening scenario right now. Uh, and probably will continue on. Again, we, we've got to wait to see what the next rate hike is. Uh, but we do have some, we do have some strategies moving forward that we're going to be employing. Now, speaking of slowing things down, you got the manufacturing index, the service index. The manufacturing index is really, it, it's slowing down pretty good right now. Again, that's what the Fed's trying to do. Uh, but ultimately, the manufacturing, when you slow down too much, it tends to go negative before it pulls itself back out. Um, when you think about it from a service standpoint, not so much. It, it's a lot more resilient, and it doesn't go down into the negative quite as often. So there, we're not too bad over here, but it is slowing down. But the manufacturing is, is, is slowing down, and it's, not, it's an interesting thing because we got supply shortages, right? And they're saying part of the inflationary problem is the supply shortages. And we're taking away the ability for manufacturing to actually get the product out to try to get the prices down because it's a supply and demand thing, right? It's basic economics. Now, when you think about the stock market cycle and the economic cycle, they don't necessarily go hand in hand. They don't go in tandem. Um, when you look at this chart, the stock market is your dark blue. Your economy or economic cycle is the aqua. And what we're looking at here is the average over time between uh, recessions from one recession to the next to the next giving you an average of how it actually plays out so in this you've got the market going up it peaks and it generally peaks before the economic cycle does and if everybody goes back to school and, and you think about the economic cycle economy 101 your economic cycle starts out with an expansion gets to a peak Everything's happy right then. People are just really kind of spending money. Everything's good. Then we get into a contraction, and that's where the recession comes in. So as the market's going down, everything's tightening up at that point. We get to the trough, and then we're off to the races again. We get into another expansion. And this is a cycle that just repeats itself over and over and over again. How long the cycle is or how short the cycle is, well, that depends on uh, policy. So when you look at this, the economic cycle is lagging the market cycle. So when we were really kind of, I mean, we were at the top of the market in, in say, the beginning of January, but you saw the cracks already starting in September and maybe even a little bit before that in the overall stock market. 
But the one thing that I want to point out with this, when you look at when the market get, hits bottom and you look at when the economic cycle hits bottom, you've got about a six month lag between that. So the market might start recovering before anybody feels like things are getting better. And why is that? Because overall, they're just not getting better yet from an economic standpoint. So this is, this is something that we watch very closely and we wanna take a look going back to the, the 20 economic indicators that we look at. Are the dials going in a negative direction or are they going in a positive direction? And if they're, if they're still moving in that negative direction, what does that tell us? It tells us we're not out of this yet. We, we got a little more uh, running room that we have to work through and it's gonna be a bit on the volatile and it's gonna be a little on the uncomfortable side. Uh, the good thing for, for our clients is we've got strategies to employ relative to these, these type markets. Uh, so we're looking at the indicators. When we start seeing the indicators stop going the wrong direction, it probably means we're close to a market bottom. Now, can we tell you exactly when that market bottom is? No, that's kind of a fool's errand. We're not gonna try to time the bottom. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to be able to look at the signs and get a feel of where things are going. <clears throat> so we put about 85% of our weight in those economic indicators, and we put about 15% weight in charting. And you've all seen us work through some of the charts, and we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, so speaking of charts in the stock market, again, January 3rd, which was my mom's birthday, and I think we broke the bank because the market just started collapsing right after we had the party. Um, <laughs> So market's gone down. It's been a very wild ride all the way up and down. And most of you know that we've, through two different major tranches of, of money, we pulled money out of the stock market about 10% in this area out of most everybody's five, you know, profile six or profile five portfolios. And then we did it again right around here but we took 15% and we actually took it out of all the, port or most all the portfolios. And this was designed because when you go back to that credit chart, you know, the Fed balance sheet and what that's doing to the bond market, you know, historically, it, you had places to go before, right? You, you know, the, the stock goes up, bonds go down, bonds go up when the stock market goes down. That, that's not happening right now we're at a situation where the stock market's going down and then what's also going down? The bond market. So the bond market's down about 15% right now. That's pretty significant because that used to be the safety net. So when you hear about companies saying, hey, I'm overweighting in equities or I'm underweighting in equities or I'm overweighting in bonds, it's because they're shifting their portfolio to accommodate what's going on in the overall market. Uh, and for us, if you don't have bonds to go to, where do you go? Cash. So we're underweighting equities. We're actually underweighting bonds and overweighting equity or uh, cash at this point in the portfolios. And again, we're not going to try to try to time the bottom because we don't exactly know where that is. Uh, it's interesting because at th this was the first support level the market was talking about saying, hey, if we can bounce off that, we're gonna be in good shape. Um, I don't think we're bouncing off of it. We're, we're, I think we're gonna go through it. And it's really interesting because the next support level's down here at about 32.73, which is a significant drop from where we are right now. Um, if you look at yesterday's market or the results of yesterday's market, the S&P 500 dropped to 34.91 before it rebounded and came back up. Well, that number is pretty significantly below this, this uh, support level. And generally, not all the time, but generally when you break through a support like that intraday, there's a good chance they're gonna come back and try it again, uh, which is why we're, we're feeling like we're getting closer to this one 
than this being the actual support level. So if we, if we think we've got the markets potentially going down even further, what do we do? Well, most of our clients have somewhere between 20 and 30% in cash right now, which is significant, right? If you think about 2008, for those of you who were with us in 2008, 2008, we went, I think we had 40% in cash during that crisis, because it was the same situation. Stock market was going down, bonds were going down at the same time. Now the bonds pulled out, which was a great thing, but for, for quite some time, it, it was going the wrong direction. Now, let's talk about one of the strategies we're looking at coming down the road here. And we're gonna wait until the next Fed rate change before we do this. And the reason is for treasuries, if the feds raise rates, it's going to put a, a dampener on the, on the treasuries. So if you've got treasuries that are low in value, we can kind of buy it at a discount at that point. That kind of makes sense. It's on sale at, at that rate. Uh, so what we're looking at is laddered treasury stat strategies. And you can set these up for really almost any, any duration you want from three months on from there. Uh, but just to give you an example, you can have a three month, six month, nine, 12, and 15 months. So let's say this is a 15 month bond ladder strategy. In three months, that first one's gonna come due. And we have an option. Is the market in good shape? Do we wanna put it back in? Well, if it's not, we can roll it back and buy another bond and just keep following that sequence. Uh, now, the, the interesting thing is it will create income. Now, you've all heard me say I don't really like dividend income or I don't like interest income. Why is that? You pay a higher tax on that than you do capital gains. So I'd rather pay capital gains tax than ordinary income tax. And for anybody who is below... Gosh, I can't remember the number. I think it's 40,000 in income. You're paying zero capital gains. So what would you rather pay? Ordinary income on interest or capital gains? Capital gains. It's zero against whatever your ordinary income rate is. Uh, so that's why we don't normally like it. But these are extraordinary times right now, right? We need returns. We need to get them someplace. Uh, so we're going to be looking at this strategy, but we're not going to employ it until after the Fed's declare what the new rate is. Uh, it's really designed to smooth it out the ride a little bit more and bring in something. Because from a cash standpoint, do you bring a lot of money when it's, when it's sitting in cash? No, you, it's virtually nothing. Because you're sitting in a, a, a money market account that might be making two basis points or 20 basis points or something like that. Well, with this, you'll make more. Uh, this allows us to own the treasuries directly as well within this ladder approach. And the duration we're looking at is really six months to three years. Now, what I want to tell you is the net rate of return is going to be somewhere around two and a half to three percent. That's net of fee return. Uh, so when we're looking at this, we're, if the three month or six month duration is almost as high as the three month, guess what we're going to work with? a three month duration because that keeps us more liquid and makes it liquid faster. Uh, so I, at the end of the day, this is a strategy we'll be looking to employ instead of pulling more cash. We'll, we'll just start putting uh, a position set up in each one of the client's accounts through the ladder bond strategy. Does that make sense? Doesn't, doesn't make sense. <laughs> At the end of the day, if the market continues to go down, we want something that's going up. And if this is one of the only things that's going up, this is kind of where we want to be, at least for the short term. It's not something we would do long term, per se. All right, then I'm going to bring Rocky back up, and uh, he's going to close us out here. Resources. We're going to be adding something new to our webinars. We're getting our asset mark, our back office strategists that do all the analysis to start putting out some materials 
that we can pass on to you guys. So you're going to start seeing us giving you some short, maybe 10, 15 minute videos from asset market strategists directly. Okay. Dan and I are still going to do monthly updates on our webinars and we're going to continue to do our quarterly live updates like this. You can find us on YouTube, right? We're recording this. This will be available. Okay, after we get through and make sure it's all edited correctly and everything, but you can go out and see the full recaps or we break sections out of it. So if you just want to see a section like Don or Brenda's section, there will be sections out there on YouTube to do that. So follow us on there. If you miss any of our webinars, they're available. You can go back and watch them. So the next one we're going to be doing is on Thursday, November 17th, at 11 a.m. We're going to give you an update, see where we're at. Uh, in a few weeks, what the economy and uh, markets are looking like and what we see moving forward. So we're at the end. There's no need for you guys to worry. You take care of your family and we will take care of you. Thank you for coming.